You wrote in your will that you didn't want your biography written. Well, I mean, what did you expect? You can't lead the sort of life you did, leave the legacy you did, then starve your readers the knowledge of the mind behind them. The great warrior against censorship and historic erasure, yet you would have had your own life censored. Fortunately, cast down the memory hole to the incinerators of mini-truth, you were not, Mr. Orwell. You might have thought only your work mattered, that the writer should be judged separately from the man, and the less people knew about the man, the better. As you yourself wrote on the great artist, you felt no shame in bashing. One ought to be able to hold in one's head simultaneously the two facts that Dali is a good draftsman and a disgusting human being. But then it's ridiculous to suppose you can actually separate the man from the writer, except of course if you're judging the work from a critic's point of view. You can't. The experience of your life, your identity, personality, thoughts, all codependent, dictated the nature, form and content of your work. Your high regard for accuracy and the truth might also have accounted for this part of your will, always the possibility of misinterpretation or plain falsehood from an onlooking stranger. How could a book capture the life and mind of one man anyway? It's true you were a private person, also complex, and no doubt aware of your many contradictions. There was also your insecurity, sometimes exaggerated, mostly felt. Why should anybody consider your life of note, considering the magnitude, the tumult and tragedy of the age in which you lived? To answer that now, well, because very few did what you did. Very few had your perceptiveness and bravery, the metal and power of self-sacrifice in combating the evils of your time. You'd had more than a whiff of totalitarianism, and it had reeked. In fact, you'd be turning in your grave, a long-haired, sandal-wearing teetotaler nosing into your past, and you watching into your telescreens with algorithms and bots detecting, influencing your clicks and swipes. Property, of course, of a great capitalist juggernaut. But I digress. You chose to go hot-picking with tramps and exhibitionists. You chose to go trudging, bent back through coal mines, despite lifelong bronchial damage. Or fighting fascism surviving a sniper's bullet to the throat. And that's just a select few. You also said you'd never succeed, that you didn't even want to succeed. You could have just carried on writing purple prose and good bad books, gone on to become little more than a footnote in the history of English letters. Well, not only do your 46 years resemble nearly a dozen different lifetimes, you attained, in fact surpassed, your primary goal of making political writing into an art. You are now one of the most quoted writers of the 20th century. With just two of your books, you enrich the English language with such memorable concepts and infinitely applicable truths on human nature and society. Perhaps to your discredit, your pen name is associated with something you despised and to which you devoted the last third of your short life combating and warning others to combat too. Even so, not many writers can claim that honor. With your mind and bravery, You've inspired no end of journalists, authors, thinkers. You're admired worldwide, quoted and referenced all over. A literary foundation preserves and advances your legacy. With multiple prizes in your name, Catalonia pays you homage with a square in Barcelona, dedicated to your valiance there. And so, to borrow a catchphrase of your beloved headmistress, your childhood big sister, who you so brutally eviscerated in adulthood, buck up, old chap. You succeeded, whether you liked it or not, and on your own terms. And this, I should say, even if your political fears were and remain continually mistaken for prophecies, even if you've been grave robbed by countless scholars, pundits, politicians, all speculating on your alignment with their causal thesis, and even if you were branded as an anti-communist, your work used as propaganda by Cold War hawks, when you were really anti-Stalinist, and in fact, in your time, one of the most revolutionary leftist intellectuals in Britain. In life, you succeeded. Your legacy, beyond your control, is an ever-mutating battleground, but one that testifies to the value of your work, the evergreen character of your observations. I'll spare you, you and you all, the sycophantic eulogies, for now. But before the big breakdown, and to partially make up for the blatant disregard of your final testament, I'll do you the minor courtesy of summarising your life, using your own words, 
and filling in the gaps where necessary. The following piece was written in April 1940, an autobiographical entry for a collection called 20th Century Authors. I was born in 1903 at Motihari, Bengal, the second child of an Anglo-Indian family. George Orwell's mother, part French, was Ida Limousin, playful, witty, conservative, but oddly bohemian. His father, Richard Wormsley Blair, was an officer in the opium department of the Indian Civil Service. Traditional, uncomplicated, patriotic, stern. Orwell sidestepped the detail of his father's profession, as he often did in real life. The family returned to England, settling in Oxfordshire, when Orwell was just one. I was educated at Eton, 1917 to 1921, as I had been lucky enough to win a scholarship. But I did no work there and learned very little, and I don't feel that Eton has been much of a formative influence in my life. Self-debasement and exaggeration. Firstly, he had won the fruits of great preteen exertion, a prestigious scholarship in classics, after studying at the preparatory school of St. Cyprian's in East Sussex, which he attended between 1911 and 1916. He famously remembered it as bleak, snobbish, and cruel, with useless teaching methods and material. Secondly, it's questionable whether Eton, perhaps England's most famous all boys public school, had no influence on him. Not just with regard to the classical education, which would clearly stay with him for life, but also his independence of thought and contrarianism, however much he would have resented the notion. It is true, though, that while he devoured books in his spare time, he was work-shy, and failed to achieve the grades he needed in order to win a scholarship at Oxbridge. Instead, following in his father's footsteps, From 1922 to 1927, I served with the Indian Imperial Police in Burma. I gave it up, partly because the climate had ruined my health, partly because I already had vague ideas of writing books, but mainly because I could not go on any longer serving an imperialism which I had come to regard as very largely a racket. The third motivation is by far and away the strongest, as we'll see. His years in Burma, modern-day Myanmar, were highly formative, influencing his literature and politics for life. His actual decision to leave the service was a major turning point in his intellectual and personal growth. When I came back to Europe, I lived for about a year and a half in Paris, writing novels and short stories which no one would publish. The image of a struggling writer is accurate, though he did manage to publish some articles. At this stage, he also decided to conduct a personal, social rebellion. He lived among beggars, tramps, and other outcasts, working menial jobs in Paris and southern England. The objective was to understand the perspectives of the downtrodden poor, and share these in the form of a literary memoir. They were later released in his first book, Down and Out in Paris and London, published in 1933. After my money came to an end, I had several years of fairly severe poverty, during which I was, among other things, a dishwasher, a private tutor, and a teacher in cheap private schools. For a year or more, I was also a part-time assistant in a London bookshop, a job which was interesting in itself, but had the disadvantage of compelling me to live in London, which I detest. By about 1935, I was able to live on what I earned by writing. He had published two more books by this point, novels in fact, Burmese Days in 1934, a fierce attack on the raw, everyday ugliness of British imperialism, and A Clergyman's Daughter in 1935, a social novel, broadly a critical failure, which Orwell called a potboiler, and requested for it not to be reprinted after his death. And at the end of that year, I moved into the country and set up a small general store. It barely paid its way, but it taught me things about the trade which would be useful if I ever made a venture in that direction again. Note his elaborations, whenever simple, honest living is concerned, but then his nonchalance and self-deprecation on totally unorthodox experiences. I was married in the summer of 1936. This was to Eileen O'Shaughnessy, a remarkable lady of Irish descent with degrees in literature and psychology from Oxford and UCL. She was unusually kind, clever, rather in the clouds in appearance, and much like Orwell, spontaneous and free-spirited. They married after one year of meeting each other. At the end of the year, I went to Spain to take part in the Civil War, my wife following soon afterwards. Hold on, hold on. He's gone from marriage and running a general store in sleepy Hertfordshire to firing shells at Franco's nationalists from trenches. There's a big gap here, and I suspect this is Orwell relishing the partly feigned nonchalance. For context, in 1936, after publishing his third novel, Keep the Aspidistra Flying, and on commission by his socialist publisher, Victor Galantz, 
he travelled north to the industrial counties of Lancashire and Yorkshire. There he sought to document the harsh realities of life for the working classes, those hit hardest by the Great Depression. He immersed himself in cramped slum housing and coal mines, among other environments, releasing his sociological and journalistic findings in his second journalistic book, The Road to Wigan Pier, which brought him great acclaim. It also marked his first public adherence to socialism and a breakthrough into political writing, when a 1936 military coup aimed to topple Spain's leftist republican government, he enrolled as a volunteer in the civil war that unravelled, fighting in defence of the republic against nationalist rebels. I served four months on the Aragon front with the Poem Militia. This was one of the many republican factions, and was associated with Trotskyists, anarchists and more generally communists opposed to Stalin's regime. I was rather badly wounded, but luckily with no serious after effects. Stress on luckily. He got shot in the throat by a fascist sniper rifle. Since that, except for spending a winter in Morocco, I cannot honestly say that I have done anything except write books and raise hens and vegetables. Those books, he mentions flippantly, were among his greatest. First was Homage to Catalonia, published in 1938, detailing his wartime accounts, and in particular, the experience of his faction's purge by pro-Soviet Spanish communists, infiltrated by Stalin's KGB. By fleeing the country, he and Eileen had only narrowly avoided arrest, torture, and potential death. The second book was his fourth novel, Coming Up for Air, fittingly written while he was in Morocco for six months, recovering from his throat injury. Published in 1939, it was his most acclaimed novel to date, exploring, among other themes, the comforts of nostalgia, the rural England of Orwell's childhood, and the looming war with Nazi Germany. What I saw in Spain, and what I have seen since of the inner working of left-wing political parties, have given me a horror of politics. I was for a while a member of the independent Labour Party, but left them at the beginning of the present war because I considered that they were talking nonsense and proposing a line of policy that could only make things easier for Hitler. In sentiment, I am definitely left, but I believe that a writer can only remain honest if he keeps free of party labels. The writers I care most about and never grow tired of are Shakespeare, Swift, Fielding, Dickens, Charles Reed, Samuel Butler, Zola, Flaubert, and among modern writers, James Joyce, T.S. Eliot, and D.H. Lawrence. But I believe the modern writer who has influenced me most is Somerset Maugham, who I admire immensely for his power of telling a story straightforwardly and without frills. My health is wretched, but it has never prevented me from doing anything that I wanted to, except so far, fight in the present war. And here we reach the year this entry was written, bringing Orwell's account to an end, so I'll try to complete it with consistent brevity. He tried to enlist when World War II broke out, but he was denied on the grounds of his poor health. He joined the Home Guard, a citizen's volunteer militia instead. From August 1941, he also worked for the BBC as a literary broadcaster in the Indian section of the BBC's Eastern Department, but left two years later on the correct suspicion that there was barely an audience for his programme. He went on to work as a columnist, literary editor, book reviewer, and essayist for a variety of magazines. By now a political animal, he was a champion of democratic socialism, a zealous revolutionary, a fierce patriot, a staunch anti-imperialist, and an outspoken critic of Stalinist sympathisers. Some of these will appear as contradictions. It's in part the intention of this series to demonstrate that they don't have to be. His life-changing experience in Spain led him on the warpath attacking Stalinist totalitarianism, writing the instant classic Animal Farm, finally published in 1945 after repeated rejections. It propelled him to international stardom almost overnight. Eileen wouldn't live to see his newfound fame. She died on an operating table under anaesthetic in March 1945. It was a deep loss for Orwell. Nine months earlier, they had adopted a son, Richard. Eileen also wouldn't live to see the end of the war. Desperate to leave bombed out London and society altogether, the ailing widower moved to the remote island of Jura in the Scottish Hebrides, which he rightly described as extremely ungetatable, to settle down and write the story and world which had been brewing in his mind for several years by then. His disillusionment with capitalist politics, his fears of Stalinist sympathies in Britain and elsewhere, his concerns with international affairs, 
particularly the Tehran Conference of 1943 and the division of the world into spheres of influence, and his own pessimism as he succumbed to crippling bronchial problems, finally diagnosed as tuberculosis in 1947, all motivated the writing of his dark, cautionary tale and novel, which has haunted millions for decades. 1984, about a dystopian, all-powerful, all-knowing, tyrannical regime in a world of perpetual war, is in many ways the constellation of Orwell's life experiences, his views, and his observations, such that tracing the novel's biographical influences has almost become a sub-discipline. After great physical and mental endurance, it was published in June 1949 to overwhelming commercial success and transatlantic acclaim. Four months later, after years searching for a wife to join him in his life of rural seclusion and care for him and Richard in his final days, Orwell remarried while in hospital. His newlywed was the vivacious literary editor and socialite Sonia Brownell, who would go on to become a fiercely lawyer executor and manage his literary estate. But Orwell's health deteriorated rapidly. On the 21st of January, 1950, days before his planned move to the Swiss Alps to recover, he died alone in a UCL hospital bed in London. His lungs had finally given out. He was buried a week later in Monday, Oxfordshire, surprisingly, given his atheism, according to the rites of the Anglican Church, as he had requested in his final will. Returning to Orwell's biographical entry, there was something else he thought was worth adding. It's written near the end of the note, almost as a bored, oh by the way, but seemingly engineered for a dash of mystery. I ought perhaps to mention that though this account that I have given of myself is true, George Orwell is not my real name. He didn't provide his actual name here, so I'll do the honours. It was Eric Arthur Blair. Writing a book is a horrible, exhausting struggle, like a long bout of some painful illness. One would never undertake such a thing if one were not driven on by some demon, whom one can neither resist or understand. This is a passage from one of Orwell's most famous essays, Why I Write. In it, Orwell lists four key motivations for his writing, which are as follows. One, pure attention-seeking and external validation. The fact this comes first on the list is quite typical of his honesty, but also his keenness to project an image of honesty. Two, a love of words and of beauty in the world. Three, what he calls an historical impulse, fact-finding and record-keeping in the age he lived in. And four, the desire to influence people's politics and how human societies are organised. We'll refer to these again, not wishing to ventriloquise for Orwell though, it does seem that there's something deeper in his motivations, something which he might have known, didn't fully address in this piece, this demon which he mentions in passing. For this, I give you the words of Sir Richard Rees, editor of the literary journal The Adelphi, and a close friend of Orwell's throughout much of his writing career. All Orwell's life, all his adult life anyway, he was really driven by a kind of mania. His beliefs were not such that it could have taken a religious form, but nevertheless, it obviously was an obsession about some kind of value, and I wouldn't hesitate to say that this value was conceived by him as relating to the human soul. Orwell wasn't religious. The patriot in him meant he had a sentimental affinity for the Anglican Church, but then he mocked Roman Catholics, and saw organised religion in similar ways as he did imperialism and totalitarianism, predatory, exploitative, and destructive to human individualism. He saw it as a barrier to socialism, and in Marxist terms, the sigh of the soul in a soulless world. But the human soul, curiously, as Sir Richard Rees points out, appears much more often in his work than you would expect. Take off the religious veneer and you're left with one of Orwell's most used words, decency. Common, ordinary decency, as he put it. Words which have often been used to qualify Orwell himself. The notion encompasses things like human goodness, injustice, empathy, moderation, honesty, and the desire to be free. The common man, this was Orwell's most cherished figure, which in his view should be the basis of any political, social, and cultural enterprise or system. The peaceful person, whom it is, quote, always necessary to protect from violence. Orwell was a humanitarian in the truly engaged sense of the term, 
and championed the essential values of the French Enlightenment. I'll discuss this first, as it seems to me the thread running throughout Orwell's entire life. It was at the heart of many of his dramatic life decisions. It was the bedrock of his intellectual evolution and almost all of his political views, and the core of his novels. With the exception of Animal Farm, of course, all of his protagonists are often fairly ordinary, irreverent people. They appear, much like Orwell in fact, to be totally lone figures, in the face of great unappeasable forces that chip away at their innate decency. Some actively rebel, Winston Smith from 1984 and Gordon Comstock from Keep the Aspidistra Flying, for instance. George Bowling, in Coming Up for Air, faced with the looming threat of catastrophic world war, retreats into youthful nostalgia. Dorothy Hare, from A Clergyman's Daughter, passively succumbs to tradition, parental tyranny, and social injustice, like a bale of hay in a hurricane. But all characters are ultimately swallowed up. The forces, man-made, but superhuman and inhumane, always win. Orwell lived through one of the most dramatic periods in human history. His life, work, and legacy were entangled with and defined by the three major crises of the 20th century, imperialism, fascism, and communism. These great hydras, Orwell, with all the qualities we'll be exploring in these videos, would face, even experience them, pick them apart, dissect them, expose, and hate them. All this with a tubercular body and a battered typewriter. There's a clear number of turning points in Orwell's life, landmarks, shaping the course of his intellectual journey. First, perhaps, was his decision to leave his position as a colonial officer in Burma after five years in the Imperial Service. He came to see what many of his peers did not see, or did not want to see, and brushed under the carpet, which was the dark side of British imperialism. Things which Orwell would write about upon his return to Europe in 1927, the economic exploitation of the colonies, deliberate underdevelopment, extortionate British monopolies crushing foreign competition. As he saw it, the empire was a racket, one of his favourite words, which subjugated native peoples, fleeced them of their natural resources, and this under sordid pretenses of paternalism. As a law enforcer, he was, as he put it, quote, part of the actual machinery of despotism, and saw firsthand capital punishment, conditions in colonial prisons, the traumatic separation of families, more generally, the illiberal practices of a sham justice system legitimate only through force. He came to realise that the whole system poisoned. Many of the everyday evils of imperialism are on graphic display in his first novel, Burmese Days and perhaps the first, most scathing novel of its kind. Among these evils, widespread racism, absurd eugenic theories metastasizing at the local gentleman's club, sexual exploitation, the pedantic classism along racial lines, arbitrary despotism. But one of Orwell's most unique observations was that the system not only corrupted its servants and slaves, it corrupted the masters too. Quote, when the white man turns tyrant, it is his own freedom that he destroys. He meant this in several ways. First, Britain, a great power with much to be proud of, profoundly disgraces herself by a conspiracy of silence over the real source of her wealth. She feeds on the weak and defenceless, growing parasitically at the expense of her victim. In an essay on Rudyard Kipling, Orwell writes, We all live by robbing Asiatic coolies, and those of us who are quote-unquote enlightened all maintain that those coolies ought to be set free. But our standard of living, and hence our enlightenment, demands that the robbery shall continue. A humanitarian is always a hypocrite. As she robs others, she merely robs herself of a freedom to a clear conscience, or the freedom not to be a hypocrite. But while metropolitans are far from the realities of empire, it's the footmen, the minions, and yes-men enforcing the racket who are poisoned. They lose their moral compass, their dignity, their decency, through supposedly patriotic service to their home country. Orwell's earliest essays explore this best. In Shooting an Elephant, Orwell was, quote, hated by large numbers of people. The only time in my life where I've been important enough for this to happen to me. The everyday protests of the Burmese people, their jeers and taunts, foul play in sports, all the acts designed to, quote, make his job impossible, caused him to hate them. As Orwell realised, even if one saw through the lies of imperialism and was, quote, secretly all for the Burmese 
and all against their oppressors, the British. The experience reduces the colonial officer to the level of a sadist. Quote, With one part of my mind, I thought of the British Raj as an unbreakable tyranny, as something clamped down upon the will of prostrate peoples. With another part, I thought that the greatest joy in the world would be to drive a bayonet into a Buddhist priest's guts. The colonial official therefore becomes desensitized. Violent oppression satiates his hatred of the colonized, and so he continually tyrannizes them. The colonized person reacts proportionally in defense. Hatred breeds hatred, which in turn breeds tribalism. And so the ever-widening wedge between colonizer and colonized becomes inevitable. At the lowest levels, the system is not only concretely unsustainable, it dehumanizes all involved. Orwell's dignity is at a pathetic low. In Shooting an Elephant, he feels compelled to shoot down the rogue but resting elephant against his will. Crowds have amassed to watch the slaying in a sort of frenzied public spectacle. He now has to shoot the elephant, to appear strong, to justify, in a show of force, Britain's baseless dominion over subject peoples. The beast's pathetic, protracted death is ultimately delivered by Orwell, quote, solely to avoid looking a fool. Orwell's guilt can be read between the lines, even if over the realisation of something so absurd. In another famous essay, A Hanging, the author narrator watches a condemned prisoner walking towards the gallows. He notices that the man, to avoid a large puddle, steps to the side. In this moment, the narrator contemplates the tragedy, quote, the mystery, the unspeakable wrongness of taking a man's life when it is in full tide. He and we were a party of men walking together, seeing, hearing, feeling, understanding the same world. And in two minutes, with a sudden snap, one of us would be gone. One mind less, one world less. After the meditative aside, the narrator watches the pathetic unravelling of the hanging, a procedure which is unsettlingly administrative, framed within the tedious bureaucracy of everyday life. So that when the deed is done, when the man's neck snaps, the box is ticked. The tension diffuses and Orwell, with the other officials, walk back from the gallows yard to the prison. There ensues cathartic laughter at the crass joke of a Burmese prison warden as they pour whiskey down their unsnapped necks. The crushing weight on the narrator's conscience, felt just moments earlier, seems to have evaporated. But the guilt is still on the author's conscience, writing years after the incident. In the essay's last line, Orwell brings the bitter, sombre reality of the scene into sharp focus, the dead man was a hundred yards away. Orwell was haunted by his memories of Burma and of his own role in the oppression. He had dehumanized his fellow man and had allowed himself to become dehumanized, a cog in the imperial machinery. He quit the imperial service, quote, conscious of an immense weight that I'd got to expiate. This insidious guilt, which stayed with him, was immensely formative, a sort of constant, dark, intellectual lubricant, for which he suffered considerably, but from which he also derived great wisdom, and so young still. At the heart of it all, and one of Orwell's most defining traits, was empathy. I don't see how his work or life decisions could have been possible had he not felt it intensely. Reflecting years later on the Burmese whom he had wronged, that still haunted him, quote, I had not trained myself to be indifferent to the expression of the human face. His experience not only made him an anti-imperialist for life, championing independence causes around the world and condemning the hypocrisies and lies of the European imperialist powers, it was also the first ism that he rejected outright, a formative case study of a tyrannical system in which he had been symbolic and actual oppressor. He had seen it at close quarters. He had been corrupted. It meant that when he left the service, he was now, in a way, immunised to the corrupting powers of tyranny, and quick to recognise its symptoms in other forms much faster and with greater depth and understanding than many intellectuals of his time. He wasn't particularly political at this point, but his societal rebellion had begun. An intense, albeit naive, humanism had formed. Quote, I worked out an anarchistic theory that all government is evil, that the punishment always does more harm than the crime, and that people can be trusted to behave decently if only you will let them alone. This, of course, was sentimental nonsense. When he returned to Europe, having decided to become a writer, colonial guilt drove him to, quote, get right down among the oppressed, to be one of them and on their side against the tyrants. And so he chose to live and work among social outcasts in Paris and London, doing for the first time what would characterise 
much of his professional work, which was to see the real state of affairs with his own two eyes, thrusting his body into extreme conditions so that mind and senses allied. He underwent prolonged hunger, near starvation in fact, overwork, and physical exhaustion as a kitchen porter, robbery, things that came with being destitute in a West European capital in the late 1920s. Those who have pointed out that Orwell could never fully divorce himself from his class origins miss the point. Even if he could always return to a life of relative comfort with friends or family, his intentions were not to be a social outcast himself. He wanted to reach the lowest possible strata of society to understand and share their perspectives. Much like the colonies and their populations, extreme poverty was something most Britons blinded themselves to, and Orwell, as he confessed, had been no exception. Tramps and beggars were, even subconsciously, seen as subhumans, afflicted with a sort of moral sickness. Orwell learned otherwise. He wanted to cut through what he regarded as middle-class oblivion, tearing some of the myths in the public attitude towards the social outcasts. He could only do that by speaking on their behalf. The lessons he learned, he would go on to share in his first book, Down and Out in Paris and London, as well as in various lectures and essays over the course of his life. This, I should add, accounts for the second intellectual catalyst of his life. Tramps and beggars, he argue, are usually ordinary human beings. They are not morally inferior, nor are they consciously parasitic. In fact, he makes the point that the sinfulness of poverty was too embedded in the English national character for beggars to be consciously parasitic. As he put it, quote, the beggar has not sold his honour. He has merely made the mistake of choosing a trade at which it is impossible to grow rich. Their faults and depravities are the result and not the cause of their way of life. In other words, they are not morally or physically repellent by nature. Their condition makes them so. For whatever reason, and there's no point in generalising since circumstances varied enormously, these were people who were simply down on their luck, left unable or unwilling to return to civilised life. The condition of homelessness trapped them, mentally, socioeconomically or both. Orwell, informed by his own experiences, notes three pressing issues of homelessness which do the trapping, as it were. One is constant hunger and malnutrition, which, as he writes, leads to, quote, a mental state of dull indifference. It dampens morale and prevents proper brain function, so that it's nearly impossible to strategize a way out of it, or more generally to even care about it. Two was celibacy and its demoralizing, humiliating consequences, which, quote, contribute to this rotting process. Third was enforced idleness. The vagrancy laws at the time in the United Kingdom made it so that tramps were perpetually on the move just to avoid a prison cell, equally exhausting and needless. Many of his findings and recommendations were novel for the time and still ring true today, even if the institutions, the laws, the causes of homelessness have evolved. Drug addiction and mental illness, for instance, do not feature in his work. Regarding institutions, Orwell writes about the many flaws of homeless shelters, spikes, as they were called around England, which did little to improve the welfare of the vagrants and, in fact, sustained their misery. He decries the degrading military character of the organisations and the condescension of certain religious charities who expected a show of contrition, quote, as though poverty meant a sinful soul. Above all, he wanted to change attitudes about poverty through memoirs, articles, essays, and lectures. As with imperialism, Orwell stresses that it isn't humans who are innately indecent, but that the existing economic system corrupts them, dehumanizes them. Desperate poverty nullifies ambition and thought, making mere survival the daily preoccupation for vagrants and the lowest rungs of the working classes. In the latter case, the economic pressures of capitalism force them to carry out inhumane work hours. The exhaustion required just to keep alive and keep a roof above their heads means they cannot truly reflect on the misery of their circumstances. The same is true for the malnourished, ever-wandering tramp. When Orwell finally secures a job as kitchen porter after weeks of being down and out, he now has a steady source of income, but the working hours are gruelling. He's constantly exhausted. There's a murder on the street outside his Parisian lodgings, a man's head bashed in by three men with a lead pipe. This rouses Orwell. Quote, the thing that strikes me in looking back is that I was in bed and asleep within three minutes of the murder. So were most of the people in the street. We were working people, and where was the sense of wasting sleep over a murder? 
Also, in the Parisian section of the book, we're introduced to Russian conmen, posing as a secret communist brotherhood who end up defrauding Orwell and his companion. Orwell describes the ruse as an act of, quote, genius. The men, quote, played their parts admirably. Capitalism creates a doggy dog world, where acts of treachery or fraud are pardonable, even necessary. Another telling anecdote is from Orwell's personal life, not in his memoirs. Mabel Fears, a friend and early lover of Orwell's, left us with a conversation she had with him shortly after his down and out days. He revealed that the woman who had left the biggest mark on him was a French girl he had met in a cafe, we don't know if she was a prostitute, and brought home to his apartment. The girl ended up robbing him of his belongings and savings. In the book, though, the thief is a young Italian man staying in Orwell's hotel. When Mabel nudged Orwell, you would never have married this girl, would you? He replied, oh yes, I would. But this was also his sense of humor. In the book, Orwell protests that one needed to have money in order to be respectable in society, to behave according to supposedly civilized standards of decency. In some ways, this was liberating for social outcasts and the extreme poor. Quote, poverty frees them from ordinary standards of behavior, just as money frees people from work. But then they're also punished for their poverty. They're not only looked down upon, their lives are miserable. All this because they're born into poverty, because they're down on their luck, or because they simply choose not to play the game. Gordon Comstock, the protagonist of Orwell's third novel, Keep the Aspidistra Flying, quits his copywriting job at an advertising firm and rebels what he sees as the money god and his bourgeois money priesthood, whom he calls the real rulers governing 1930s England and corrupting its social mores. As he sees it, the Ten Commandments have been reduced to just two. One for the employers, thou shalt make money, and another for the employed, the slaves and underlings, thou shalt not lose thy job. He sustains his rebellion for some time, and writes poetry, but the system ultimately swallows him back up. I bring your attention back to the earlier point on the basic plot of practically all of Orwell's novels, ordinary, fundamentally decent characters struggling against relentless forces which ultimately engulf them. The economic pressures force Comstock to marry the woman he loves after she falls pregnant, and he returns to a life of middle-class dullness and mediocrity. He goes back to his old job and writes advertising copy for a new product that eliminates foot odour. It's the sort of soulless consumerism which instigated his revolt in the first place. Keep the Aspidistra Flying is an exaggerated satire on the predominance of money in an empty, middle-class consumer society. Orwell wasn't particularly political at this point, therefore the novel wasn't a critique from an engaged Marxist mind offering socialism as an alternative system. But it's very much a snapshot of Orwell's mental landscape at the time. Comstock rebels against what society deems necessary for success. He reflects that his schoolmaster had, quote, rubbed it into him, that he was a seditious little nuisance and not likely to succeed in life. Very well then, he would refuse the whole business of succeeding. He would make it his a special purpose not to succeed. In other words, if winning by social standards meant, quote, to settle down, to make good, to sell your soul for a villa and an aspidistra, this was Orwell's symbol of dull middle-class respectability, then it was honorable to lose. Comstock is a mouthpiece for Orwell here. In fact, Comstock's fictitious turning point finds a direct parallel in Orwell's own life. He wrote about the mindset that seized him after leaving Burma, quote, failure seemed to me to be the only virtue. Every suspicion of self-advancement, even to quote unquote succeed in life, to the extent of making a few hundreds a year, seemed to me spiritually ugly, a species of bullying. In other words, if society dictated that subjugating and oppressing foreign peoples was respectable, to hell with society. And in fact, the roots of this attitude in Orwell predated Burma, traceable back to his experience at the snobbish preparatory school of St. Cyprian's, the subject of his famous essay, Such Such Were the Joys. Between the ages of 8 and 13, he had felt like a failure in every scholarly, physical and social activity he had been forced to take on. If winning at that dreaded school meant turning into a priggish sycophant, then to hell with his headmasters and their notion of success. If winning means robbing you of your decency, reject whatever it is that tells you to win. And now for the third turning point, 
The research for Orwell's second non-fictional book, The Road to Wigan Pier, first published in 1937, gave him the opportunity, this time actually funded by his publisher, Victor Galantz, to once again throw his body into real conditions of poverty. He documented living and work conditions in the industrial counties of Lancashire and Yorkshire, badly hit by the Great Depression, inspecting slum housing and mines and factories. As with Down and Out in Paris and London, one of the things Orwell most wanted was to dispel middle and upper class oblivion about working class conditions. Following his investigations, he allows the bleak data of his findings to speak for themselves. Disease, rampant malnutrition, economic instability, unemployment, poor job security, cramped, dirty housing, the real brutal misery of the working classes in one of the world's wealthiest countries. Orwell especially focuses on minors. All of us really owe the comparative decency of our lives to poor drudges underground, blackened to the eyes, with their throats full of coal dust, driving their shovels forward with arms and belly muscle of steel. And yet their conditions were so unknown. More than anyone, perhaps, the miner can stand as the type of the manual worker, not only because his work is so exaggeratedly awful, but also because it is so vitally necessary, and yet so remote from our experience, so invisible, as it were, that we are capable of forgetting it as we forget the blood in our veins. Like much of his best non-fictional work, he uses a first-hand account with a writer's sensitivity and dramatic flair to destroy the common myths. That famous scene in chapter one where the author narrator, watching from the window of a train, locks eyes with the wretched girl cleaning a foul drain pipe, her expression of despair with just a passing glance, that scene and passage expose and shatter the self-comforting lie of the apathetic and privileged, quote, it isn't the same for them as it would be for us. But The Road to Wigan Pier is most important for being the first work in which Orwell publicly declares his allegiance to socialism. Many of his friends and colleagues were socialists. Clearly, his own political and social views were already on the left, but he hadn't aligned himself with socialism. Skeptical and in certain aspects even opposed to it until then. The Road to Wigan Pier, besides a sociological and literary work, also reads as a political pamphlet. It is a rallying call to get to the basics of what Orwell conceived as socialism. Fascism loomed ominously in Europe and Asia. In a prosperous, supposedly democratic society, the working classes decayed in disease and squalor and misery. Socialism for him was the only way to combat the evils of capitalism, which included, as he would often argue, fascism in an extreme mutated form. All that is needed is to hammer two facts home into the public consciousness, one that the interests of all exploited people are the same, the other that socialism is compatible with common decency. In his eyes, the problem with socialism was that it was being degraded by its most prominent and vocal exponents. Socialism, he writes, at least in this island, doesn't smell any longer of revolution and the overthrow of tyrants. It smells of crankishness, machine worship, and the stupid cult of Russia. This wasn't all. Convoluted language, trivial disputes on obscure doctrine, bourgeois baiting, as in, your manners aren't proletarian enough and offend my anti-bourgeois sensibilities, among other reasons, diluted the revolutionary fervor of socialism. They repel the skeptic, alienated the working classes, hampered unity, and made a mockery of what socialism actually stood for. In his own words, quote, we have got to fight for justice and liberty, and socialism does mean justice and liberty when the nonsense is stripped off. Before the book was even published, Orwell was in the trenches on the Aragonese front, a Republican volunteer in the Spanish Civil War. Fascism, as seen in Hitler's Germany, Mussolini's Italy, and now Franco's vision for Spain was for him a worryingly tempting alternative to socialism for the masses and represented an obvious assault on basic human liberties. Quote, if you had asked me why I had joined the militia, I should have answered to fight against fascism. And if you had asked me what I was fighting for, I should have answered common decency. When he arrived in Barcelona in December 1936, 
The region of Catalonia had, for several months, been under the control of communists and revolutionary anarchists, making it a major republican stronghold against the fascist forces of General Franco. Though the revolutionary peak had been in the summer, several months before he arrived, he saw with his own eyes something of a prototype for a genuine socialist state. The revolutionary, egalitarian, near-utopian atmosphere was to him astonishing. In Homage to Catalonia, published in 1938, he writes, It was the first time that I'd ever been in a town where the working class was in the saddle. Practically every building of any size had been seized by the workers and was draped with red flags and with the red and black flag of the anarchists. Every wall was scrawled with a hammer and sickle, with the initials of the revolutionary parties. Almost every church had been gutted and its images burnt. Churches here and there were being systematically demolished by gangs of workmen. Every shop and cafe had an inscription saying it had been collectivised. Even the boot blacks had been collectivised and their boxes painted red and black. Waiters and shop walkers looked you in the face and treated you as an equal. Servile and even ceremonial forms of speech had temporarily disappeared. Nobody said senor or don or even usted. Everyone called everyone else comrade or vow and said salud instead of buenos dias. The experience convinced Orwell that it was a cause worth fighting for in Britain and all over the world, but his wartime experience did not go according to plan. Infighting between the Republican factions broke out in mid-1937. It pitted status communists against the anarchic revolutionary factions. Orwell's faction, the Workers' Party of Marxist Unification, or PUM in particular, was targeted. It fell victim to a counter-revolutionary clampdown, led by the Republican government, at the behest of Soviet Russia. The PUM was smeared as a bunch of Trotskyist traitors, as Franco's fifth column. Arrests and purges of the faction's leadership and members ensued. Orwell and his wife, Eileen, only narrowly escaped arrest or death. Some of their comrades were less fortunate. And so for Orwell, this was a revolution betrayed. Stalin's agents had infiltrated the Republican war effort and suppressed its revolutionary wings. His conviction, expressed in homage to Catalonia, that the Stalinist crackdown lost the Republicans the war, is historically flawed. He too admitted so later in life. But his early assessment that the USSR aimed to suppress the revolution is vindicated by history. Stalin and his allies wanted to safeguard relations with Britain and France. To do that involved quelling the threat of major workers' revolts on their doorsteps. For Stalin, a statist, socialist government, loyal to the Soviet Union, was preferable to a workers' republic run by anarchists and Trotskyists. This betrayal led Orwell to direct his attention to Stalinist communism. Turning point number four. He was one of the earliest Western thinkers to see the Soviet Union for what it was. A deeply reactionary, paranoid, authoritarian state, subverting a revolution premised on equality and liberty. In Britain and elsewhere, many socialists still regarded the USSR as a bastion of hope for the future of world communism. Orwell would spend the rest of his life trying to convince people they were deceiving themselves if they thought the Soviet experiment was the shining path to common decency and the guardian of the rights of the common man. Stalin's superstate was a dangerous, oppressive fraud, and he would hammer home its lies and hypocrisies as long as he lived. He never lost hope in the possibility of an egalitarian, socialist state of the kind he had witnessed in Catalonia. He himself describes the catalyst, quote, The Spanish Civil War and other events in 1936 and 1937 turned the scale, and thereafter I knew where I stood. Every line of serious work that I have written since 1936 has been written directly or indirectly against totalitarianism and for democratic socialism as I understand it. And here we have the motivations for Orwell's most famous works, Animal Farm and 1984. Both satirize, that is, condemn and caricature the Soviet Union. Animal Farm does so exclusively. The fable parodies the Russian Revolution and the early history of the Soviet Union. Barn animals overthrow their human slaver, but the animals are deceived and exploited by a clique of wily power lusters, the pigs, who go on to betray the animalist revolution. They rule as bourgeois tyrants, violate the revolution's commandments, 
and ultimately fraternize with the original human enemy. Orwell's allegory is clear. Stalin's Russia and its minions betrayed Marxist doctrine and the Bolshevik revolution. The oppressed become the oppressors and the ordinary decent masses are caught up in the endless cycle of oppression. 1984 satirizes totalitarian governments more generally, combining fascism and Stalinist communism into one dystopian regime. Less of a prophecy, it is a cautionary tale. Orwell himself wrote, I do not believe that the kind of society I describe will necessarily arrive, but I believe, allowing of course for the fact that the book is a satire, that something resembling it could arrive. It is a show of the perversions to which a centralised economy is liable and which have already been partly realisable in communism and fascism. 1984 is the story of one man's rebellion against a totalitarian party that imposes complete control over the minds and bodies of its subjects. In its bid for absolute power, it wants to destroy the very concept of human liberty. Winston Smith is a middle-ranking bureaucrat who works for the Ministry of Truth. Far from what its name suggests, his job is to rewrite history to suit the official party line. His job involves permanently destroying any evidence or historic data that conflicts with party propaganda. He rebels in every way possible to him, but at every turn, he fails. He tries to find happiness and meaning. He cannot. He tries to remember the world before the rise of the party. He fails. He finds love and rebels sexually, but it doesn't satiate him. He attempts to join a secret brotherhood. It's a trap. He tries, during torture, to cling on to objective truth. The party controls it. He still tries to hate the party. He is brought to love it. The world of 1984 is the denial of everything that it means to be human. It is a world devoid of happiness, of independent thought, of reason, of historical memory, of sensuality, privacy, art, beauty, of useless objects and trivial pleasures. The party claims control over objective truth. History is systematically falsified. Only power worship is allowed. The suppressed miseries and sexual frustration of the outer party members are vented in frenzies of hatred towards ever-changing state enemies. The party seeks to limit the possible range of human thought. Newspeak, the language party intellectuals were devising, is therefore promoted at the expense of modern English. It is, quote, the only language in the world whose vocabulary gets smaller every year. And so as words like liberty, rights or justice face the prospect of being cast into oblivion, so too do the very concepts. Dissent is, quote, literally impossible, because there will be no words in which to express it. Orwell was a dying man while writing 1984, stricken with tuberculosis. His mental state was bleak, and this was no doubt imbued in the novel. Pessimism pervades it. The ending is haunting. Humankind has lost to blind tyranny, to the unrelenting pursuit of power for the sake of power. It appears there is no hope under Ingsoc. Hold that thought. After the end of the novel, the reader finds an appendix entitled The Principles of Newspeak. It discusses the grammatical structures of Newspeak and its differences to Old Speak or Modern English, but several passages in the appendix suggest that Orwell was telling the reader more than just how tyrants destroy language and free thought, that the appendix is more than Orwell geeking out with his invented language. The narrator is fictitious, part of Orwell's fictional world. So who is it? An important passage is this. Listen closely. Quote, it was expected that new speak would have finally superseded old speak by about the year 2050. End quote. Would have superseded, not would supersede. It's a curious but noteworthy bit of grammar. Would have finally superseded by about 2050 implies that it didn't, in fact, supersede Old Speak by that year, and that the time of writing is sometime after 2050, perhaps even long after. What seems clear, though, is that even when the passage was written, New Speak still hadn't been implemented. The fact that it is written in modern English 
and the writer talks openly about concepts like equality or freedom, concepts which the party wanted to suppress, suggests one thing, that the party is no longer in power, having imploded or been overthrown by invasion or revolution, and that the passage is written by a distant historian or a linguist, analysing a dead or dying language. The comfort the reader can derive from this then isn't just that the party's efforts to suppress language and freedom were persistently delayed, but that Orwell believed an entity like Big Brother's party was finite, that the total destruction of human liberty, even in thought, in the pursuit of absolute, permanent power, was vanity. I should add a biographical detail, which emphasises the value of the appendix to Orwell, besides being a great testament to his integrity as a man and as a writer. The American Book of the Month Club, promised him upward of £40,000 in sales for the publication of 1984, on the condition that the appendix and the long section on Emanuel Goldstein's seditious book be scrapped. £40,000 is over a million pounds in today's currency, and this, he was told, was a minimum estimate. Orwell refused this offer outright, writing to his agent, a book is built up as a balanced structure, and one cannot simply remove large chunks here and there unless one is ready to recast the whole thing. I really cannot allow my work to be mucked about beyond a certain point, and I doubt whether it even pays in the long run. In the end, the American publishers yielded. The passages were included, and the books were published. Orwell died before enjoying most of the royalties. Now, it's understandable that he didn't want the section on Goldstein's book to be scrapped, it's so contextually important to the world of 1984, and deleting it, as he said, would have involved recasting the whole thing. But an appendix? On the grammatical structures of Newspeak? Only very loosely connected to the story of Winston Smith, an appendix on the technicalities of creating a new language by party intellectuals? A piece that did only that would have been worth scrapping if it meant keeping that sum of money, surely. It could have been published separately as an article, no, it was much too important for Orwell. Would it be too much of a stretch to say that this dying man, conscious that his days were numbered, wished to offer some hope after the despair and gloom of 1984, that he needed Winston, the last man in Europe, to fail as the ultimate warning of his cautionary tale, but to express that even if a democratic society like Britain's should lapse into totalitarianism through apathy and failure to resist it, then it wouldn't be forever. I now refer you to the scene of Winston Smith's torture at the hands of O'Brien, core member of the inner party. We create human nature. Men are infinitely malleable. Or perhaps you return to your old idea that the proletarians will arise. Put it out of your mind. They're helpless animals. Humanity is the party. I don't care. In the end, they'll beat you. Sooner or later, they'll tear you to pieces. I know you'll fail. There's something in this world, some spirit that you will never overcome. What is it, this principle? I don't know. The spirit of man. Did the proles of Oceania finally rise up and overthrow the government, as Winston Smith had hoped? In the novel, he muses, if there was hope, it must lie in the proles. Because only there, in those swarming, disregarded masses, 85% of the population of Oceania, could the force to destroy the party ever be generated. If only they could somehow become conscious of their own strength, they would have no need to conspire. They need only to rise up and shake themselves like a horse shaking off flies. If they chose, they could blow the party to pieces tomorrow morning. Surely, sooner or later, it must occur to them to do it. Critics, and especially Marxist critics, have found Orwell's representation of the proletariat in 1984 degrading and harmful to socialism. It is true that, especially from a socialist thinker and writer like Orwell, their portrayal is not flattering. They are mentally dormant, childlike, solipsistic, doled by darts, pornography and the lottery. Consequently, they represent no political threat to the rule of the party, 
and are spared the mass surveillance of the party telescreens. An official slogan even states, proles and animals are free. It leads the reader to question whether Orwell was misanthropic, as indeed several critics have wondered, and even his own brother-in-law. His pessimism was real by the end of his life. He was in terrible pain, in and out of hospital for long periods. He had lost his wife five years prior, leaving him alone to raise their adopted son, aged 10 months at the time. For 20 years, he'd felt prolonged disillusionment with the upper and middle classes in his country. For 10 years, disillusionment with the direction socialism was moving in internationally, and more recently, dashed hopes for a popular revolution in Britain during World War II. What he saw as the apathy of the British people simply mystified him. Quote, I don't know whether this semi-anesthesia in which the British people contrive to live is a sign of decadence, as many observers believe, or whether on the other hand it is a kind of instinctive wisdom. Interesting. Both decadence and instinctive wisdom are embodied in the proles of 1984, in a way which seems Orwell is almost undecided on the matter. Their decadence is in their irresponsibility, their pleasure-seeking, the childishness of instant gratification and their dulling of thought. One wonders how much of the real Orwell is in Winston in the scene at the proletarian pub, where he questions a man old enough to remember life before the rise of the party. The old man's mind and memory wander into trivialities, to Winston's exasperation. Quote, The old man's memory was nothing but a rubbish heap of details. And then the line, They were like the ant, which can see small objects, but not large ones. It's details like these, which led Orwell's brother-in-law, Humphrey Dakin, to state, Rather diffidently, I put forward the theory that he disliked his fellow man. He had a contempt for his fellow man, intellectually. But I wouldn't be misled by theories like this. Orwell was many things, but I don't think he was misanthropic, nor was he a snob. He understood that class privilege and access to education accounted for differences of ability, not potential, and that membership to a class had little bearing on one's intelligence. In fact, his bashing of the intelligentsia was far more of a constant, as he held them to the high intellectual standard which they themselves claimed by virtue of their profession. One of his memorable quotes is, quote, One has to belong to the intelligentsia to believe things like that. No ordinary man could be such a fool. No, the proles are not a projection of Orwell's attitudes toward common people. They are a parody of political apathy. They are a satire, an epitome of a blind, uncritical, unmoving society. And so, they are a literary device for Orwell to stress what a totalitarian world would look like if people did not wake up, if they failed to develop class consciousness and instead succumb to vain, selfish hedonism. They are, in fact, as Winston discovers, more human than he is. He represents the thinking, rational side of humanity, which, unlike that of other party members, has not yet succumbed to the party's brainwashing. But throughout the novel, Winston lives in fear, in paranoia, they consume him. His human instincts are repressed, frustrated and anguished. His thoughts and desires are violent, even homicidal. But the proles, outside the stifling control of the party, represent a direct link between the soulless world of 1984 and life before the rise of the party. They embody aspects of humanity which the party members had lost in the clamp town, to the great boot stamping on a human face forever. The proles as Winston mused, had stayed alive. They had not become hardened inside. They had held on to the primitive emotions, which he himself had to relearn by conscious effort. They could laugh, sing, love, feel. Their lives could be private. They were endowed with the same spirit Winston remembered in his mother, quote, a kind of nobility, a kind of purity, simply because the standards that she obeyed were private ones. Her feelings were her own, and could not be altered from outside. When he eventually overcomes his contempt for them, he realises, quote, they were not loyal to a party or a country or an idea, they were loyal to one another. Therein is the instinctive wisdom mentioned earlier, a model for emulation, the hope for mankind. Totalitarianism was the greatest threat to humanity. The human spirit is disposable, contemptible to the party, as it threatens their bid for absolute power. 
Tyrants thrive off the suppression of human instincts, thought, happiness, freedom, privacy. And so for Orwell, humanity needed defending at all costs. When Orwell was in Spain fighting fascism, in the barracks of his militia in Barcelona, he met a young Italian soldier. It was a moment he would never forget. Something in his face deeply moved me. It was the face of a man who would commit murder and throw away his life for a friend. There were both candour and ferocity in it, also the pathetic reverence that illiterate people have for their supposed superiors. As he went out, he stepped across the room and gripped my hand very hard. Queer, the affection you can feel for a stranger. It was as though his spirit and mine had momentarily succeeded in bridging the gulf of language and tradition and meeting in utter intimacy. I hope he liked me as well as I liked him, but I also knew that to retain my first impression of him, I must not see him again, and needless to say, I never did see him again. Orwell wrote about the same man nearly five years later, when I remember, oh how vividly, his shabby uniform and fierce, pathetic, innocent face. The complex side issues of the war seem to fade away, and I see clearly that there was, at any rate, no doubt as to who was in the right. In spite of power politics and journalistic lying, the central issue of the war was the attempt of people like this to win the decent life which they knew to be their birthright. Orwell presumed that the man by then was long dead, but after the war, he had written an ode to him. It is one of the occasional moments in Orwell's life where prose was insufficient to capture the full extent of his thoughts and feelings, and so he turned to poetry. Your name and your deeds were forgotten before your bones were dry, and the lie that slew you is buried under a deeper lie. But the thing that I saw in your face, no power can disinherit, no bomb that ever burst shatters the crystal spirit.